another science paper on IgG4 antibodies post mRNA vaccination came out. As you know, I do comprehensive summary of all of that data as it's being published. So I'm going to do a video on this one as well. There's some new information coming out as well that is uh, interesting. And this also, this study from Puerto Rico, I believe was, was where this was done, also gives us the longest time frame in terms of what do we know how long these now IgG4 antibodies can last. My name is Dr. Mikhail Rashik of Mara Genomics. Let's get started. So this is fairly complicated study. <laughs> so bear with me. There is going to be a lot of information to talk about. First, they also con this is another study that confirms that um, non-vaccinated individuals do not produce IgG4 antibodies typically post uh, COVID-19 um, episode, so post-infection. This obviously study confirms that those who took mRNA vaccination three shots will produce IgG4 antibodies, unless the study also shows this, you were infected first. So we're gonna get into details of, of that. And they also looked at um, people with irritable bowel disease. So that's some new information. One more thing that they did that was really interesting is they also, besides looking at the antibody subtypes, IgG1, 2, 3, and 4, they also looked at the neutralizable of the blood samples collected from these individuals. So basically, how, how well these same antibodies were able to prevent virus infection um, of cells. And in terms of neutralizability assays, we did a video on that, so check that video out for the background. It's just a, a measure, a test, laboratory test to see how well given antibodies could prevent viral infection of cells is really what it is, but this is a laboratory test. And that provides some really interesting information as well, which I see differently from how the authors interpreted, interpreted the data. And to me, this actually supports that whole concept that what we're really witnessing is, is um, steric immune refocusing so meaning the antibodies that are being produced by by vaccinated people eventually switch to different kind of antibodies than when encountered first vaccines meaning the what the antibodies target eventually changes changes and they target different areas of the spike protein than than originally elicited and we're going to talk about that why and this this neutralizability assays might help with this and finally so these are my summary of the paper because many of your requests i provide the summary and finally the authors mentioned that these igg4 antibodies because of their potential pathogenic role in biology means that that further mrna vaccination boosting should be abandoned. So now there's a growing growing group of scientists calling for this. So the, um, based on the fact that we're seeing these IgG4 antibodies pretty much in everyone who has taken the mRNA vaccines with few exceptions. Of course, check out the past videos on, in this series to learn what these exceptions are. We'll talk about some of it in this video. But they call for stopping further use of these mRNA vaccines on the account of these IgG4 antibodies. And as I mentioned, there is now more and more people proposing that this is what we what should be done. Okay, so let's get uh, through this. Why did they have such a long data? Because of course, we're looking at four, four shots now and, um, and how much the vaccines were spaced between each other. So typically um, there's, First and second shot, it was a very short interval. It was only maybe maybe uh, just three to four weeks, right? But the booster shot, the third shot, oftentimes was multiple months after. I think on average in their ass is about in their in their study was about eight months. And then the booster after that, the fourth shot, whether it was another regular Pfizer, Pfizer shot or um, bivalent vaccine, then uh, then that was about a year spaced apart. So now this gives us a data 
that is almost two years in time span. So it gives it, it allows now scientists to really see how long these uh, IgG4 antibodies could, could last. And typically, of course, we're focusing on IgG, IgG, IgG antibodies because normally, scientifically, you correlate those responses to protection against infections, right? So now let's go through the studies that they did, and they looked at four different cohorts. Actually, they, did, they looked at five cohorts. The fifth cohort was samples that were pre-pandemic. They looked at that just to be able to calibrate the assays. I'm not going to talk about that but very, very correct way of, of making sure that what they're seeing is accurate. And then let's go through the other four cohorts. So cohort number one were the non-vaccinated people who have been infected. They had 85 samples and they were able to take these samples. M most of them, I think they were able to divide into the category of when the person was, was uh infected in relation to when the sample was collected. So if the inf person had infection, and none of these were hospitalized, by the way, these non-vaccinated individuals who were infected by the virus, if the infection, if the sample was collected a month after infection, so that was group, uh, group one, uh, within two months, um, the sample was collected two months after infection, that was group two, and then more than two months was group three. And really the take-home message is, as following. The longer the time span from infection and sample collection, the more total amount of IgG antibodies were seen in, in those blood samples. So what really it, this means is that those who are non-vaccinated but infected, they produce really effective long-lasting response, immunological response, okay? None of them Almost none of them produce IgG4 antibodies, with, the, with one exception of one individual. Everything, everyone else where they, they, where they did detect IgG4 antibodies, they were basically at a threshold level of detection, so very, very small amounts. And of course, you can have very small amounts of IgG4 antibodies. That's not an issue. It's how much total we have that could be an issue. So that's basically the take-home message confirms the pre previous information, prior studies that, that non-vaccinated individuals typically do not produce these, these antibodies. Now, majority of them, I think they mentioned 70% of those individuals, uh, they detected IgG1 uh, antibodies. This is against spike protein, of course, by the way. And then something like 30% had IgG3. Those are the best ones. Those are the favorite antibodies, if you will. The ones that we expect um, are important because they really can help clear the infection. And then 8 and 9% of the individuals, they, det they detected IgG2 and IgG4 antibodies. So the ones that are more rare uh, observed in blood, and we'll talk about the, their roles in a, in a moment. Now let's move on to the vaccinated cohort. So they, they did... Um, they did a couple of things. So um, they took vaccinated individuals who were infected first. So they were infected, then they received vaccination. They had 12 of those. And of those 12, eight of them were Pfizer vaccinated and um, three uh, and four of them were Moderna, Moderna vaccinated. And these are, these are basically the only individuals uh, the only individuals that in the study who had Moderna shot, everyone else for the remainder of, of the video, I'll be talking about basically those who had um, Pfizer shot, okay? And, and again, the take home message here, oh, and by the way, I should go back to the non-vaccinated people because I forgot to tell you about the virus neutralizability. So those antibodies that they produce that last really long time, all great. One problem is that these antibodies were able to neutralize or prevent the original virus that started the pandemic, that variant. It worked very well. Those antibodies worked very well against that variant. It worked against um, other early variants, but Omicron, Omicron, forget about it. It, it. They were not able to stop infection against Omicron. Okay, so that this is uh, 
So that's an important observation. Now let's go back to the group of vaccinated people I'm telling you about right now. So the take home message is that those who were infected first and then vaccinated. And uh, I can't remember off the top of my head how many shots of, uh, of vaccine, vaccine shots these individuals had, whether it was three or four. Uh, but uh, they did not produce, they did collect three samples. I believe it was four shots, but they, they pr collected three samples at the baseline and then post different time points be, uh, after vaccinations. And the take home message is that these individuals did not produce those IgG4 antibodies either. There was, again, out of those 12, I think one person had a, had a IgG4 antibodies uh, that were elevated already at the baseline. And, and uh, otherwise, you do not see this. So that confirms the previous observations I was mentioning to you as well, that basically, meant, basically shows that infection prior to mRNA vaccination protects individuals from producing those mRNA, <laughs> producing those IgG4 antibodies. But now let's talk about the neutralization test, meaning how well did those antibodies protect from virus infecting the cells. And here, those antibodies protected well against prior variants, but it also protected against Omicron. So that's interesting. But because they had serial samples, they actually tested those serial samples for neutralization against Omicron over time. And at first, I think post three shots, you saw very high neutralization and then it started waning. And then it went back down to about average of 50, okay? So that's interesting because here we go. This is why the authors mentioned the concept of hybrid immunity uh, was suggested in, in uh, scientific articles that is the best type of protection, meaning both infection and vaccination is the best. Why? Because as you can see, those who are just infected, never vaccinated, they can clear Omicron versus, and same thing, as I should mention, in those same group of people who were infected first and then vaccinated, they were not clearing Omicron after two shots of the mRNA vaccine, but they started clearing Omicron after three shots, really high, 90s, all the way to 90s, some or 90, 90 some percent clearing, pre preventing infection. And then that started to wane after time down to 50. But nevertheless, after two mRNA shots, it did not protect against clearing against Omicron infection, but it, but after three shots it did, and this is where that concept of uh, hybrid immunity might might uh, be working well. So anyway, um, I think this might be something else. So let's continue. Let's continue to the next cohort. The take home message though, IgG4 is not produced in this group. So now let's go to the group that was never infected but vac vaccinated, which will be the majority of mRNA vaccinated people. Now this is all people who, who uh, had now Pfizer. Now here they divided this cohort into two cohorts as well. So let's go on the first one first. It, they had, I believe it was, very small number. I think it was only four individuals. But here's the interesting part. They had almost two years worth of data and they had six samples across those two years. So of course they had one prior to vaccine. They had one sample immediately soon after the second shot and then a month after third shot. And I think it was um, nine months after third shot and then one month after fourth shot and then six months after fourth shot. Okay. And and um, some of them, I can't remember whether this was three times Pfizer shot original and then bivalent, it might've been that. Either, either way, the take home message is that all of these individuals started producing IgG4 antibodies uh, after, soon after the third shot. And then those IgG4 antibodies remained high for the remainder of their study. So, Basically, here we're looking at 
at about on average nine months post last sh mRNA shot, these individuals were still showing high levels of IgG4 antibodies against spike protein. And basically, we're talking about high levels that were not really dropping down in these individuals. So they just remained high. Okay. Um, so then that's, that's the valuable information here is because they had really detailed sampling his, history for these individuals. Now let's go to the other cohort. I believe they had um, how many individuals? I think they had eight individuals. So these are small groups of people, not big. Uh, again, all, fi all Pfizer. And uh, in this case, they, uh, they had just one sample, but 1.7 years on average post last shot. So long time period. And again, the take home message here is that after that last shot, the IgG4 antibodies retain, remain very long time, for very long time. So 1.7 years, then they combine those two data just to see what they can get in terms of compiling that. And again, on average, they're saying that 18 months post last shot, IgG4 antibodies remain very high. So now this gives us uh, probably the first longest timeline we have in terms of how long the, these IgG4 antibodies can be retained by mRNA vaccinated individuals. So really long time. So we need even longer time frame to, to get better data. But they also did neutralization assay. So again, how well these same antibodies as a total from those blood samples were capable of preventing virus infecting cells. And here now what they're saying is that in all of those individuals, the neutralization against Omicron was remained very, very high. One thing that they also mentioned is that this ability to neutralize against the Omicron correlated with the levels of IgG4. So this is really, really interesting. So here what we're seeing is following. Non-vaccinated individuals cannot clear Omicron. Those who were infected first, then got vaccinated, at first do clear Omicron, and then eventually that, that ability wanes, but only after third shot, the second shot not. So that means also once those IgG4 antibodies are produced. And then those who were never infected and just took four shots of vaccine, then they all seem to be producing, uh, all seem to be clearing I, uh, Omicron. This is where it's interesting is because this neutralizability is one of the metrics that people, scientists get excited in terms of thinking vaccines are working very well etc. Right? Now, and as I mentioned, these authors pointed it out, this correlates with, with um, IgG4 antibodies, but the authors mentioned themselves, we don't think it's IgG4 antibodies actually involved here. They think it's likely the re-stimulation of IgG1 or maybe other, uh, other antibodies such as IgM or IgA. I don't know why they would say that they don't expect IgG4 to participate in neutralizability. Um, I think they, they should. I think IgG4 antibodies, you don't expect them to participate in cytotoxicity, meaning they don't induce response of our body to start killing infected cells, but, can, but these antibodies still should be able technically to interact with the viral particles and have an influence in their ability to interact with the receptors to infect cells. So not really sure why the authors made that conclusion. So I wouldn't agree with them. This is why we're seeing neutralizability. And this is where we're going to come back finally to this concept of steric immune refocusing, meaning what might be happening is the following. Perhaps the reason why we're seeing this neutralizability has nothing to do with actually the ability of vaccines producing high quality neutralizing antibodies, but more the quantity of antibodies and because 
there is some data suggesting that immune refocusing could be happening where repeated immunization with mRNA vaccines seem to be steering the antibodies to start attacking different directions, different sites of the spike protein. This might affect these antibodies' ability to, to be very good, uh, good at, at binding the virus, but it still could neutralize the virus if the quantity of antibodies are high. And this is also what Dr. Gerd van den Bosch proposes, if I understand his theory correctly, which I might not, so just keep that in mind, okay? And, and, uh, and what we might be seeing here is the fact that we're seeing neutralization is because we're seeing these huge quantity of antibodies that might not be excellent at actually stopping infection, but might be good at potentially neutralizing antibodies when they, they exist in high quantity. So one thing that I found was maybe lacking in the studies is, is not having those serial time points of neutralizability. What we might have seen that in is in the cohort of, of people that were infected first and then vaccinated, and we saw there was neutralization against Omicron, and then that st started to drop. We would need those studies as well for all other cohorts as well. And if there is re retained neutralization, we need to know, is it because of the fact that those individuals, if it's retained, is because of the IgG4 switch. So it's the high quantity of IgG4 antibodies that might retain this neutralizability. And if that's the case, that's not what we would want potentially. And the reason why is because you do not want to substitute the desire for neutralizability of the virus for production of IgG4s. And why is that? And the reason why is because the authors remind us, look, IgG2 and IgG4 antibodies are not common post-virus in infection, typically. You don't expect to see them. This is why the ob observance of these IgG4 antibodies in mRNA-vaccinated individuals right now is capturing so much attention because it's recognized we're witnessing something abnormal here. This is not what is expected. So then what is going on? This is why... This is being studied so much because IgG4 antibodies are just simply not often seen. This is also an opportunity to understand what they even do biologically or at a greater detail. So <clears throat> IgG2, typically they remind us that, look, those show up after bacterial infections more often in IgG4. They have protective roles against parasite infections as well as against allergens, but they can also potentially be involved in, um, in pathogenic roles, and they mention autoimmune diseases and cancer, right? One more thing they mention is that IgG4, IgG4 antibodies can also show up in people after taking medication that is biologics meaning medication that is something like a protein that is being injected into people, which now also helps to reinforce the concept that it's the, it's the recognition by the immune system of antigen over and over and over that induces production of IgG4. So that means if you, indu if you put a medication into your body and the body body doesn't know it's a medication, it just sees as something foreign coming into your body, then perhaps this is why IgG4 response is being induced eventually because the body is like, well, this is something that clearly is present here, present in my body often, might as well not, uh, not attack it with the immune system and, and why you might see the production of IgG4 antibodies against medications. But again, that reinforces the concept that it's presentation of too much antigen that induces these, these un IgG4 antibodies. So really, I think what we might be happening, what might be happening here is, is the only reason why we're seeing clearance of Omicron right now post mRNA infection is because there is steric immune refocusing taking place, allowing large quantity of 
of subpar antibodies being built, but enough of them because their quantity is large, they could clear these in infections. So to know this for sure whether that's happening, we need serial time points of these neutralizability assays to see whether the neutralizability continues over time or not, just like we've seen in one of that cohorts, right? So we need to know that. And if it does continue, is it because of the production of IgG4. Now in these assays, in, in all these Pfizer individuals, when they did that and they looked at neutralizability and yes, hey, great, those who were not infected but vaccinated, they were neutralized against Omicron. But remember, they eventually, most of them switched to IgG4 antibodies. And again, we don't want neutralizability potentially for in, in exchange for IgG4 antibodies because of the potential negative role that we still don't know what might they might be doing in this context right but as i mentioned now there is a number of scientists calling that look we should really be reconsidering for further boosting okay they did one more cohort that i want to tell you about as well and that's basically th those who who were diagnosed with er <clears throat> irritable bowel disease these individuals were previously on medications and they were in remission. So, so they, unfortunately, we don't know what medications that, that, that was. It would have been really good to know this. Nevertheless, they took three Pfizer shots and, and there were, they, I think they had four samples of these individuals, typically baseline and soon after second shot. And then they had, they had uh, one, at about one month after third shot and about six months after uh, third shot as well and again the take-home message is that after third shot these individuals also started producing high levels of IgG4 antibodies and that high level of, of antibodies of IgG4 antibodies was retained over time because they were able to see that but here's the only difference between that group and anyone else studied and again they were not infected first um, in comparison to uh, those who were vaccinated healthy individuals who were never infected. The only difference is those with irritable bowel disease over time, six months after the third shot, they had one, almost one and a half time, times less of the IgG4 antibodies than, than about one month after the third shot. So unlike the other people, their antibody levels were starting to drop a bit. And again, no explanation as to why. Very, very, it would be really interesting to know exactly what kind of medications these guys were on potentially as to why are we seeing this drop because it would be valuable to know how such a drop of these IgG4 antibodies can be induced in, in people who do retain high level of IgG4 antibodies. So the final conclusion is of these authors is like, look, these IgG4 antibodies, because they they do play pathogenic roles. Those are their words. We should stop boost, boosting further with mRNA, uh, mRNA shots. And they also even went as far as saying that they suspect that the excess deaths of Europe that has been observed and documented might be due to these effects of IgG4 antibodies. And uh, one more theory that, they, that I found very interesting that I want to wrap up this video with is they propose as to why, how, how the IgG4 antibodies might be patho, pathological in, pathologic, uh, pathogenic in nature. And, um, and that was, they didn't mention anything about reduced effector functions, which is what, what I've been focusing in, in, in my videos in this series, meaning effector functions is, is, is um, the stock of IgG4 antibodies are not recognized by immune cells the same way that stocks of IgG1 or IgG3 are recognized. Instead, what they are suggesting is that if you're going to have too much antigen present, if you're showing too much antigen, eventually what you can do is, is uh, exhaust the immune system so that your T cells are no longer, mm, they're suppressed. And that's one of the ways how IgG, uh, how you can correlate 
presence of IgG with tolerance because they believe the presence of this IgG4 is a, it shows immunological tolerance. And they're suggesting that, look, having too much antigen eventually will lead to T-cell exhaustion. And if you have T-cell exhaustion, this is how you might start correlating that with development of autoimmunity. Also very interesting concept, which also makes sense. So there might be multiple biological impacts due to something like accidentally presenting too much antigen to the to our immune system all right so okay that's it who was i told you warned you this is going to, going to be complicated information but we are learning a little bit more and more and as i mentioned now there is a more and more scientists are becoming leery of these igg4 antibodies in that we basically they seem to be observed in almost all of the mRNA vaccinated individuals. And more and more scientists are saying, whoa, 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 we better, we better hold off here until we understand more. So how are we supposed to understand more, like in terms of potential clinical impact, right? Like, what should we do? You know what, this is, there's a cool statue behind me. You know, this is not that crazy difficult to achieve technically, because right now we have so many people with IgG4 antibodies, and the reason why is because we have so many people with mRNA vaccination that, and enough time has elapsed, this is now a few years post-vaccination, that now we can start correlating those who were vaccinated with mRNA shots versus those who were vaccinated with other COVID-19 vaccines versus those who were never vaccinated and start seeing what kind of medical outcomes such individuals have and whether one group is associated with more common negative outcomes than the than the other and that's not that challenging now to execute because there will be plenty of data to start seeing this and these authors also do mention that you might not see these effects immediately because of the fact that there might be like a time period in between production of say IgG4 antibodies or suppression of the immune system by, uh, of the of the T cells before we see clinical clinical effects so they're saying don't be surprised if that were to to happen but nevertheless now we have few years and we could start basically assessing this data. All right, okay, that's all I'm gonna have for you today. Please share the video, please like the video, please leave a comment as well, right? All of this helps us, YouTube likes that, and, and, and we want to continue producing this content. I'm obviously absolutely into this IgG4 information, and the reason why is because we're really exploring new field of science here. There's just simply not that much information in general on, on IgG4s, and now we're basically gaining lots of information, so it's one of my most interested topic to study besides the vagus nerve that's another one that blows my mind right now the more and more i study it i can't i can't just get over it how fascinating it is so obviously i'm looking forward to producing more content for you and also finally please check out our patreon account and i'll see you next time